Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no holes Ball. Thank you and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, special episode from the Lights Out Podcast. We got a guest by way of Timmy Ford. Timmy, you're knocking out that San Diego area for us. Shannon Googerty, welcome to the podcast. Thanks Let's for go. having me. So, Timmy, you and Shannon, training partners, you guys had a very unique group. It was like you, Dean Lister, Jocko. You guys had like a, a pretty special group of people back in the day. Can we agree on that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't so, forget Greg Mack. Greg, Greg Mack. Mack and that's true. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, Shannon, thanks for joining us. Why don't we start with your journey, your beginning into mixed martial arts? Um, I, in my notes, I got that you went to high school with Dean Lister. Was that the beginnings of mixed martial arts, or did it start prior to that? No, I actually didn't even know him in high school. He was just a little bit older than me, so he he graduated before I even entered into Hilltop High School, and. Um, they used to call it Hill Pot. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, he graduated. I think it was like 95. And then uh, I didn't I didn't quite get there until after he was already graduated. But um, I had heard of him and then I knew of him going, you know, and starting to uh, train jujitsu and do mixed martial arts and he later became the king of the cage champion. And um, yeah, so I was just a wrestler, just wanting to like kind of follow in the footsteps and none of my other friends wanted to. But uh, I was like, ah, oh, screw this. I'm going to go learn some jujitsu. So um, I believe, well, the only place that I was aware of at the time back then, like right, right, probably my senior year of high school, the first year I got out, uh, Dean was already at city boxing and that's where I met, uh, Tim and Greg and, uh, and Vera. Jocko. Yeah. Brandon Vera. Yeah. 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 All of them. Yeah, he, he, uh, I think Mark Dion was the owner over there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how God bless his soul. Yeah. Yeah. How, how was he as a, uh, I don't know, as somebody that you guys kind of fell underneath in regards to he owned the place. Mark Dion, he was yeah. intense, very intense dude. <laughs> he was a little guy, but he was, um, yeah, he, um, he, he wouldn't take sh bullshit from anybody. You know, he, he was just always, you know, on the attack mode and, um, he wanted to have the, the, the baddest fight team in San Diego, if not like California and whatnot. And, um, I remember, like when I first signed up, I was like, Hey, I'm going to fight for you guys. You know, I'm going to do MMA. And he's like, yeah, 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 sure. Just sign the contract or whatever, <laughs> you know? And I was like, Oh, sure enough. Like within, I would say like four or five, maybe six months later, I was already, I already had like two professional MMA fights, uh, under my belt at that time. And, um, and then, yeah, later on, he was like, okay, yeah, we could just uh, cancel your membership. You don't have to pay as long as you keep fighting and representing city boxing and whatnot. And so that's how it all started. So, so Tim, boxing. Yeah, T Timmy Ford, what about you? How, how was, I mean, you were obviously on the grappling side. You, you socialized real well with the team. How was your experience with Mark? Uh, Mark was an intense and kind of true businessman. Uh, I think ultimately he had, usually the right uh, kind of uh, intentions, but he was rough around the edges and kind of got what he wanted all the time. But as far as my, my kind of relationship with him as, as a paying member, he was absolutely awesome. I mean, knew my name every time, you know, come up, shook my hand, remembered every, every conversation we ever had. So uh, my, per I wasn't a fighter, so, but my personal kind of interactions with him as a paying member was, was amazing. Uh, so, so how I, I mean, dude, I'm from Chicago. I've never met any of you guys or Mark Dion. And like, from my perspective, through the few people that I've interviewed and talked to him about, it was business. You had to be careful with him. And he had that East coast uh, delivery, oh, yeah. For sure. which is 
a little rough anywhere else in the country outside of like New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania type area. Uh, um, he, he, I think he was from Boston. You know yeah, what I mean? And, that's yeah, right. His, his Same thing. Of, of, yeah, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was like, you know, we never had a gym like that in San Diego and like city boxing was like Disneyland. I mean, we were used to, you know, splitting Taekwondo studios in half and having to hear kios going on on, on, a, on a in between a sheet on the other ha- on the other side so we got city boxing and he had a hand in opening all that up it was pretty amazing so eric del Furo was with you guys as well am i correct in the beginning at least um he, not it not really in the beginning he was kind of like um when i met eric del Furo, he was uh basically one of the owners of total combat like the, yeah. you know, MMA based, organization based out of Tijuana. Exactly. Him and um, I believe it was like his ex-wife or ex-girlfriend, Diana Ocampo. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, yep. they were they were they were running that. So like he was basically the matchmaker and he would come around. So we would all know who he was and whatnot. And it it wasn't until after a few fights um of mine where he actually started like um participating in like helping coach and getting training partners and um yeah because he just knew a lot of people so he would like get you know these just like uriah favor i remember came into the city boxing with um what was his name james irvin Um, oh wow the sandman yeah back in the day i remember and like that that was the first time i had ever met them but like I remember Brandon Barrow was like, oh, yeah, you got to train with this guy, you know. And um, so we trained and uh, he was like just slowly starting to come up, like becoming the king of the cage champion or whatever he was. And then uh, that later turned into like the WEC. And then, um, yeah. And then it wasn't until a few years later when Dom showed up and started training with us. Coming out of the cruise. Yeah. 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 So, so Dominic Cruz is came from Arizona. Yes. All right. So I, I, I got a couple questions in between, but the, the side note about Dominic Cruz. Mm-hmm. So I've interviewed Drew Fickett, uh, Seth Bagzinski, Joe Riggs. So I've got like a real good grasp of that early Arizona scene, which is pretty incredible. Like it's, it's yeah. pretty insane. For and, sure. um, in essence, what they said was that Dom came from a background that um, is very difficult to wrap your head around in regards to the abject poverty and the living conditions, but his desire to succeed like far surpassed what he was given, like the foundation that he was he was given to uh, use as a platform. Yeah, for sure, he was. Uh... He came from some humble beginnings, him and Derek and uh, trailer park. He grew up in a trailer yeah, park. Yeah. 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 And um, I remember he, when he first drove his uh, whatever year it was, his <laughs> Mitsubishi Eclipse. <laughs> it was like one of those old school Eclipse. It was a convertible. Yeah. He came out here and then uh, Eric basically like took him under as his, um, you know, number one student pretty much. And, and and uh dom like had eric as his uh you know head coach and would just listen to him and you know would it would come and train with all of us you know uh but uh yeah eric was primarily dom's uh head coach for sure and then we all kind of saw dom succeed uh his success and um you know he was just i think i i almost want to say he was undefeated all the way up until that Uriah Faber fight. I think he beat Uriah and then he lost to Uriah. Like he was like here, here I'm in the Midwest. So what we're doing is we're like studying the fight finders and anything that we can get like on message boards. And then like, we just kept hearing about Uriah Faber, Uriah Faber, Uriah Faber. And then it was like, wait a minute, this guy, Dominic Cruz beat him. And it was like the, the bullhorn for Uriah Faber was very large, but the one for Dominic Cruz was, it, it just it wasn't as big, but like anybody that kind of knew the sport understood that Dominic Cruz was just as legit. Yeah, for sure. He, he Dom, like when it when it came time for those WEC days, I remember going to the 
hard rock and um you know being one of his corner men helping out and we we became really good training partners and um and yeah uh i remember he would fight uh who was it um joe benavides he fought like everybody from uh team alpha male at that time and uh beat him yeah so yeah, he was soundly. like our he soundly was, he, yeah. yeah he was he was like our he he came with that that you know crazy style where he's just non-stop moving and then with great takedown and you know he's quick so so dom had a huge like different style and uh, uh i would say it was uh it was a good little advantage on all of us because everybody else at that time would just primarily fight like you know uh really specific you know they would throw a couple strikes and try and get a takedown and whatnot but dom was just you know moving his head all over the place it's like a taekwondo style but it's not you know it's got that tkd bounce but the angles were completely different it's it's unique it's very unique yeah for sure all right so in the early days obviously you're an old school cat your first fights in 2004 so california you guys have got like a really proud heritage in regards to like the fighting arts and you know where you guys were at you guys were you know bring your lunch to work type guys but then in Los Angeles, you had like Ian McCall and you had like the Lords out there, like the, the gang that they had. Did you guys have any interaction or butt heads at any of the jujitsu tournaments? Um, no, not really. It was, uh, no, no, not, not, not really. Not at all. Actually. Uh, it was all just like, they were a little lower weight class than me. I probably should have been fighting in a lower weight class, but at the time that, uh, I got signed and uh, actually my whole entire career, I fought, uh, 155 until, uh, until after the, the ufc and then i i realized hey i could make you know featherweight why don't i just do this so um so yeah um i i i think ian mccall joseph benavides dom uriah they, they were all kind of like oh well uh uriah Faber was like a featherweight at one point in time but i think he realized that yeah he can make one uh bantam weight as well so i think he did that uh but yeah like no the only one who really pissed me off at tournaments at jujitsu tournaments who like i could never you know i would always have like a rival with or i would like i wouldn't even say it was a rival because he would beat me would be uh glover and um oh, and, glover uh, glover to no, no 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 tyrone glover, glover. Ty tyrone glover okay okay i would say tyrone glover yes i would go against him but also uh jeff glover also oh, jeff oh, glover dude. was a little yeah and then and then also um uh bill the grill bill cooper okay yeah those were those were like the guys who would just be at every single naga uh i i i can't even remember what what the name of the tournaments were back then but they grapplers would be at quest. all of them grapplers quest that, yeah. that's right that's right yeah I remember that. That was cool. So in 2007, I was like one of the drivers for ADCC. And oh, okay. it, it was in Trenton. And I can't tell you how many times I heard people motherfucking Jeff Glover. Like, you know, <laughs> he's a piece of shit this. He's a piece of shit that. And like, I don't know these people. I'm just driving. And then I get Jeff Glover in a car. And he's like this real cool skateboarder guy. And I'm like, Jeff, why? You know, I didn't mention who. I just said, Jeff why do you rub people wrong so much? You know, I'm like, I've had a car, like three carloads of people that have all mentioned your name at one point. And he's just like, well, I don't kiss anyone's ass, dude. I don't give a fuck. I'm just here to fucking do me. You know, I'm not, you know, looking for this or looking for that. And I, I, I respect Jeff. I respect Jeff a lot. He's good. He's yeah. got another different style, a very unique style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Total Combat, July 25th, 2004, it's your first event. Again, it's your first fight ever, and your debut bout is against Cub Swanson. Yes. That's I, insane. 
Yeah, when I heard uh, who I was fighting, like, I I, I want to say it was like a month out or something. That was when, like, Eric told us, okay, you're fighting this guy, you know. And then uh, my head coach at the time was one of Dean's, like, really good, uh, you know, training partners. His name was Brent Stuklik, and he later became, like, Hans Mollenkamp's, um, you know, partner when they were – uh, doing throwdown and making cages and all that stuff. Um, they were just trying to rival, like, uh, tap out, I guess, at the time. And um, I remember when he told me, like, yeah, you're fighting this somebody by the name of Cub Swamp. And I'm like, Cub, what a dork, you know? Like, no, he, he, he's already giving himself a, a nickname and he's never, he hasn't even had a first fight yet. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. And I didn't really think anything of it. I, I trained really hard. I had, I believed in my team too, all of my training partners that I had. I was lucky enough to, you know, be training with Dean had just came off of winning, um, you know, uh, the absolute at, at, uh, at um, ADCC in Brazil, you know. So um, I felt pretty confident in my jujitsu it was just my striking it was like what i knew i was kind of still green in but uh i had brandon there also brandon vera was you know fixing all, up all my striking and um we had some other good boxing coaches there also robert garcia um manny um and then uh I rolando, just had a bunch of good... rolando oh rolando is one of the one of my favorite training partners ever he's like just been so good so, so there for everybody like he's such a team player man and uh yeah so i i felt pretty confident going into my very first uh mma fight to be honest and i never even saw him uh at the weigh-ins he never showed up to the weigh-ins because i guess apparently he lived in like uh palm springs or something like that at the time and uh so he came down to you know, the event and uh, on the day of the fight. So I never saw him weigh in. I didn't really care. I, 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 but I remember at the rules meeting when Herb Dean was like starting to give us the rules meeting and put uh, all the fighters in one room. This is the one, one memory that I have of him. The very first memory that I had of Cub was I, I saw this one kid who was getting his hands wrapped and he just was covered in tattoos and for whatever reason, that just like intimidated the shit out of me. I was like, I hope I don't fight that guy, you know? And then I didn't see him until we were standing across the uh, the ring from each other. And it was a ring. It was in a cage back then in, in uh, I think it was called Zool's. Was the or Tangaloo. Tung Tangaloo. Or Tangaloo. Yeah, you're yeah, right. You're right. Tang Tangaloo. I was there, yeah. Yeah, yeah Tangaloo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was cool. That was a fun time. Yeah. Well, well here, you won by Rear Naked Choke. Um and, you know, from what I understand, when Cub would see you at events afterward, like this match haunted him. Is that true? Oh, yeah. I bet. I bet. Yeah, for sure. I, I beat him pretty quickly and pretty decisively. And um, and yeah, I remember when I wasn't even at an event like my brothers. I have two brothers, an older and a younger brother. And we all train jujitsu. And um, they would they would say that, oh, yeah, I saw Cub at this uh, this tournament or this tournament. And he's like, he's like asking, like, where you're at, where, you know, uh, what's the next event you're going to do? He wants to he wants to compete against you again or whatever. And I'm like, I don't care. I, I honestly didn't even really think anything of it. And I actually had more fights uh, really quickly right after that, like all over the place. Um, it, it didn't go down on my record for whatever reason, because that's how long ago it was. But I remember I, traveling to like the Inland Empire and then um, Javi Vasquez, he was like the referee and um, I was fighting. I fought like I, I thought it was a pancration fight, but no, like before, like right before we stepped in, they're like, oh, we're just, there's no commission here. So we're going to go ahead and turn it into <laughs> MMA fight if you guys want. And we're like, all right, I guess, you know, sure. So uh, I did a couple of those, actually. So, yeah, that was okay. good times. Good so, time. Timmy, Yo. in, in Mexico, Tijuana, 
Yeah. I think we can all agree here. Well, one, I mean, there's been several promoters from the United States that have promoted events in Mexico and just yeah. never were seen again. What was like, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's a hundred percent true. So you should have was... asked Dean about, you should have asked Dean about that time he got into, into the bar fight and uh, got jumped by seven Mexican mafia guys. And he put the one guy in a Camorra and, and snapped his, uh, snapped his arm and they were chasing him to the border with like guns. <laughs> you should oh ask him about that one. Yeah. Hey, what was, what was the crowd like? Any yeah. issues like with, as I know we've had Antonio McKee on, he said, you know, I mean, Antonio says a lot of things, but he was like, it's bullshit. It was all mafia and blah, 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 blah. Did, did you experience any of that there? Not me. No, no I just, I honestly was, uh, I had a lot of friends. I sold 200 tickets for Eric Del Fierro for that Cub Swanson fight, that very first one. 200. Where were you at on the card? I was towards the end. I was probably, you have to probably be. like, yeah, I was probably like, uh, like third to last or second to last. Yeah. But I, I remember it was like, um, I can't remember who was the main event, but I was the main event. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and yeah. Mike, Mike, Stan is, Stan is half Irish and half Mexican. Right. And then he had, you know, he had, to, he had the Mexican people pulling for him, but he would come out to that, uh, dropkick Murphy song. You know, and like well, everyone Barroom just Heroes? loses their Which one? Uh, dun, 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 Shipping dun, 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 off to Boston. Shipping off to Shipping Boston. Off to Boston. Okay. And he'd walk out to, and people would lose their damn mind. All of San Diego would be there. He had Mexican friends there too. Like, you know, it, yeah, it was it was a big deal back then. It, was, it really was cool. Well, if you, yeah, if you sold 200 tickets, dude, you're Eric Del Fierro's favorite fighter. Yeah, yeah. That's why uh, <laughs> I, I remember, I think I was the one who asked for Cubs rematch or whatever, like uh, the rematch, because he kept like, you, like you said, he was like hounding my brothers around at tournaments, going and chasing them and trying to fight, you know, trying to compete against them and trying to compete against me. And I was like, screw it, let's go. Let's do it again. And then if you want, I, I didn't really want to because I was like, I had already beat him. But um, I guess he was starting to like build up a name and win in the uh, King of the Cage and some other events, I guess. So yeah, um, he rattled off five in a row, and yeah, yeah, yeah good for I him. Mean, so, so he's... I was like, okay, this is this is this would be a good little, uh, you know, this would be good. Let's let's do it again, and um, and he beat me. He beat me the second time, but I think statistically that's what happens. Like, uh, like the rematch, like when you rematch somebody, it's like the statistics are so much higher in favor for the person who lost the first yeah. time, but, but whatever it is what it is. And I learned from that fight and it was a good fight. Um, uh, yeah. And, and I think it was the Lister training center where you were training at right around that time. Yeah. We had left city boxing, uh, for whatever reason, uh, <laughs> Dean and nobody, dude, nobody, nobody wants to talk about that reason, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, like I just remember like Brent and Dean were like, no, nah, we're gone. We're, we're, we're going to leave. So we, and coincidentally they moved, uh, the gym or they opened a gym like, it was probably about a mile away from my house compared to like, compared to like, uh, I was about 15 miles. I was, I was living in Chula Vista at the time. And, um, and city boxing was obviously in downtown. Um, and then once they left, once we all left and we went to, yeah, Lister training center or whatever that opened up in Chula Vista. So I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. I'm cool with that, you know, but, um, I could, provide, I could provide a little. I could provide a little. I could provide a little insight on why everyone left. Um, basically, what happened was Dean was uh, getting into a mark a little bit, and it was not that long after that Brandon got brought in, and then uh, basically, you know, Mark started using Brandon as as kind of like leverage. Well, we we don't need you as much as we used to, and Dean's like after that was like fuck this, we're out of here. You know what I mean? That type of thing. So, yep. Yeah, yeah Lister's the man, about right? Yeah, Lister's a man. He, he's doing a, a seminar up here in a couple months. Uh, one of the guys, one of the one of my buddies is Jim. 
you know, he's like, fuck, dude, we got to get Dean up here. So, yeah, Dean's coming in about two months in the Chicagoland area. Um, all right, so you, you moved to the Lister Training Center. Josh Valencia is your next opponent that's on your record. But you said how many in between uh, Swanson and Valencia, how many fights in between did you have? You I remember kind of- I had at least two, at least two, because I remember, like, where we fought. We fought in an outside event. And it didn't even have a name. And I remember it was Javi, Javier Vasquez, who was the referee. And then um, another time, uh, there was another event that I went with the the major twins, who were other uh, training partners of ours at the time. I don't I don't know if they had any real MMA fights, like like in Total Combat or whatever. But um, I know they were like training partners with us at city boxing at Lister training center, but they, they were a bunch of twins with back at Hilltop. Uh, we graduated the same year and they just said, Oh yeah. Um, we know of this event. We're going to go fight in this like underground. It was in Los Angeles. It was in downtown LA. It was in some like underground nightclub. And uh, Chris Brennan was the referee for that event i remember who i fought i fought one of his guys too so yeah um i remember those two fights for sure that never went on my rec- record but i'm pretty sure because um like they didn't have like anybody that it wasn't it wasn't legal <laughs> i'm sure but um yeah it, that, those were good times learning experiences too did you ever attend any of the cobra fighting federation events with Mark Hall's no, events? no, I so, heard of them. I heard of them, but I, I I never made it out to one of those. No. What about the Kaja's Cage Combat? Mm, I again, I heard of them, but I never never made it out to it. No. He's got an interesting story, Kaj, and like uh, he very well may have been the first MMA organization in the United States. And he definitely had an octagon before the UFC. Where was it located? In LA, LA. Area. Oh, okay. And shit, it was, uh, that Pedro. might have been it. That might have been it. San yeah. Pedro. Oh, yeah, San yep. Pedro. Yes, yes. Pedro. yes. Yep. That that was where Chris Brennan was the referee for sure. That I fought one of his guys. I remember. And, and, and you know, like even like push it forward even more. If you look like Google search Kaja with a K, Kaja's Kaja. Kaja. Combat. Okay. If you look at the logo, it's the exact same shape as tap out the tap out logo. Ah, uh, so like his tap like tap out clearly lifted the design for that, and the UFC clearly took the octagon idea from him. And it's like uh, like when the UFC was suing people for using the octagon, they sued everybody except him. Wow. Yeah, interesting. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, another promoter in Mexico, you fought for uh, for Marco Perez in Heto Maximo. Yes, he was a good guy. Eric didn't like him for sure, but uh, he was a good guy. He was good to me anyways. He, he sought out, like he, I don't know how he located me. I think it was like MySpace or whatever at the time. <laughs> and uh, he found me and he's like, hey, I want you to come fight over here. And then I remember... Uh, he paid, I mean, at the time, I think he paid, he paid me more better than what Eric paid me for, for sure. And, um, and I didn't even have to really sell any tickets to that event. And, and I remember the, the venue was pretty cool. It was the auditorio, right? It was like, like the auditorium where they now still have, uh, some MMA fights in, but it was cool. It was a good. Hey, little... I remember. Uh, I think Reggie Cardillo fought on that card too. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace, Reggie Cardillo. Yeah. Yeah. And then Chuck Liddell. I remember Chuck Liddell being at that event and being blindingly drunk. And some of the Charger guys from the San Diego Chargers were trying to force him in a limo, and he looked like he was going to swing on all of them. And there, it was Lorenzo Neal, all his friends, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 You know, like I lived in Mexico for a few years. When you go head to head with a local in their own backyard, uh, it's a slippery slope. Like Eric Del Fiero, I, I think after he retires from the fire department, 
I, I think his interview in regards to his dealings in, in Tijuana and promoting MMA events as a foreigner, I guarantee that's one of those must listens. Yeah, he's actually going to be living in Mexico pretty soon. He's uh, he's going to be the head uh, at the PI. coach at the PI. Yeah. So is he closing? Uh... Is he closing Alliance then? Oh, it's already closed. Yeah. Um, They're just all training out of uh, another gym. It's like more of a boxing gym, but they have some mats in it Um, down there in um, it's in, it's in Bonita Um, pretty close, not too far away from my house, but it's called Azteca boxing club and uh, like Phil Davis, um, Jeremy Stevens, Stevens. I've seen Dom um adrian melendez uh, right he's the boxing coach yeah adrian melendez is 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 the owner and and chris martin also chris martin used to be one of the one of the boxers like out of city boxing back in the mark dion days yeah he was like one of robert garcia's uh yeah boxers so oh, him yeah. and Adrian Melendez, yeah, the, those are the two guys who own it. Yeah, it's always surprised. Like Alliance has such a good name, but they kind of rode underneath the radar. You know, especially with the lower weight classes. I, I don't know. I, I was kind of. I, I had heard he was going to the PI. I was. I'm. I'm kind of shocked that he's closing the gym, though. I mean, incredibly successful. Yeah, he's just. Uh, what he told me was he just is. He's overpaying rent. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to pay rent anymore. So basically like what he did the last couple of years was he didn't even lease uh, out of um, victory. Uh, the owner, Joe and Jocko, they would just let the Alliance fight team go in and train there, you know, uh, at 1030 AM, the, you know, professional, the pro fight team uh, schedule. So they would train there from like 1030 till noon and um yeah that's it so they would just use it for more for marketing and then alliance used it more for having a vent having a gym you know having some some mats and a bag and and a spot to 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 meet at and train oh um, yeah well okay it, what do i know <laughs> yeah uh two, three, four. I think your fourth fight was against Sean Bias. Total Combat, December 17, 2005. It was the uh, first time you ever went to the distance. That is yeah, not that was easy. A, that was a tough one, you know. Um, honestly, I, I had no idea with this kid. I He was another one who I never saw at the weigh-ins. I just saw standing across. This Was this a Total Combat fight, I believe? Yeah it's so funny how a lot of those total total combat fights i never even saw we never even saw each other weigh in like it was always like i would show i would the first time i would see this guy with a tattoo on his face back in 05 you know when 20 years ago or whatever it was uh 19 years ago like he was standing across the the ring from me and um he was a good wrestler i gotta i gotta i remember that and um yeah, we went the distance. I I remember I I had he squeaked out a, a win. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like a really like, you know, brutal fight. It was just kind of like one of those fights where I kind of expected to win because this guy was a looked like a dork and he had a tattoo on his face at the ripe old age of like, you know, 19 or 20, whatever he was. And I, I knew I was just a little older than him. And I was like, ah, how good can he be? But he was a really good wrestler. I'm not going to lie. He was a good wrestler. Yeah. But uh, again, another thing that I learned from something in my journey that uh, I was able to take take from, you know. I mean, you say that when I mean, you lose a decision there, obviously you're a big ticket seller. Then you lose to Cub Swanson in a rematch. Usually when somebody loses two fights in a row, they're done. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I remember that like, uh, it was Eric who was like, okay, yeah, now we, we want to fight to Cub Swanson. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. You know, I, I was the one who agreed to it, even though he was, the one who was like trying to, you know, chase me all over Southern California at the time uh, to, to get another fight, to get a rematch with me. But um, 
no, he was more prepared for me. He was more prepared. That fight, um, I got to admit, I, I'm not making any excuses at all whatsoever. But my head coach at the time, who was Brent Stuklik, one of Dean's uh, training partners at the time, he was helping me train. He was helping me fight. He was my pad holder. Um, we, uh, Greg, Greg McIntyre was my, my number one training partner at the time. And for whatever reason, or uh, I believe like he got in a fight with his girlfriend or broke up, his girlfriend kicked him out of the house, but Brent didn't show up to that fight. So it was just me and Greg Mack who were in my corner or Greg was my sole train, uh, corner man for that fight. And, um, yeah, that was the very first fight I believe that they had in California at the time, um, uh, back, back in it the was, day. It was, yeah, it was, yeah. it was total combat. And, and you know, what's crazy. Once it became legal, MMA became legal in California. It pretty much ended Del Fierro's run in T1. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I just figured, I mean, at California commission, it's a lot different now than it was then. Like okay. Armando Garcia was in charge when you were there. What was your dealings like with him? Um, he was cool. I mean, I didn't really have too many conversations with him. Uh, it was just like, you know, he, I, I think he made me pee in a cup or something like that maybe. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't too crazy. Like, uh, it was pretty, pretty chill, just like how it was in total combat. But a lot more it felt a lot safer because there were ambulances outside just in case you know finally it wasn't like you, they would throw you in a taxi and ship you off to the uh the 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 tijuana hospital <laughs> the bed of a pickup truck yeah the bed of a yeah. pickup truck yeah <laughs> for sure he uh it was interesting how he went out man like he definitely did make a lot of friends armando garcia definitely did make a lot of friends with a lot of promoters and uh he unceremoniously was kind of taken from that seat and there was there was a lot of happy people to see him leave i can only tell you from my side <laughs> chicago looking at california so you lose two in a row um march 11 2006 and it doesn't really slow you down at all you jump right back there in september uh jose uh, carrillo you get him, um, Joey Rad Anzo. Um, that was at 160 pounds. Right around this time, like you really started kind of moving the needle. And I think you were sponsored by what 40 Thieves Clothing way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Dang, you did your research. Wow. Got, got yeah. to, brother. Ben Lee, man. That guy is a, that guy was awesome. He he gave me my first pair of shorts for my first fight, and uh, and he just kept shipping me sending me shipments to my house of, of clothing, clothing and geese, shorts and geese. So, yeah. And, 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 you know, like, unlike most people that only had four months prior to their first fight, four or five months prior to their first fight, you were getting submissions at a very early, like at, at a high rate, very early in your career. We had a good room there at City Boxing, right, Tim? Like, dude, there were some killers. No joke. There were some killers like uh, I could just go on and on. Matt Terra, Terra, um, fucking uh, who else? Uh, it was Tino a, a, Martinez, uh, a whole bunch of guys who are now all black belts. You know, all, obviously they've been black belts for uh, Ryan or Apollo, Chance Ferrar, some Tim killers. Camus, Tim Camus, Tim Camus, Echo yeah. Charles, Christina Echo. Coates, yeah, Chris Ruiz. Yes. Oh, Chris Ruiz. Yes. Another great training partner. Yes. Yeah. So we did, we did, yeah. it, 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 it was like, it was literally like, um, fighting for your life every day in there. It was, it was good. It was good. But with a little bit of technique on the side, you know, <laughs> did you ever get to practice with, uh, Ronnie Yaya? Yes. Yes. I remember, um, him coming down, I, he was like what I was one of his, or he was one of my, uh, great training partners when, after we left the Lister fight team, 
Um, we went to um, the boxing club in Kearney Mesa with Melcher Menor. Um, and that was Brent Stuklik's idea and Dean's because we wanted to improve Dean's striking. And um, at the time we had already taken off left uh, city boxing. So, so we went to the boxing club there. Mel was helping out uh, Dean with uh, striking. And uh, that was when Dean was fighting. I think he just had just gotten signed to pride um, was starting to fight in pride and um and yeah so we all just kind of followed him all of us a, a lot of us you know um and yeah that's where echo well, they had to actually that we came there was so many of us jujitsu mma guys that um because it was a you know a muay thai gym a boxing gym and they had to get another um unit like another space to accommodate us. So they had to add to the gym. Yeah. Where they made a whole jujitsu area and everything. And then all of a sudden uh, the owner, I guess like we obviously, you know, made his pockets a lot thicker. So um, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to open up another uh, uh, boxing club. And then um, he did. And then we needed more, you know, black belt, instructors and then for whatever reason or however it, it however it came about was honey yaya he just showed up one day and was like yeah and he had just i think he had just won um he beat leo vera uh at, mm. at at wec rear naked choke i remember and then he showed up at like our gym you know one day um and then like they're like you want a job and he's like yeah sure <laughs> so yeah how was it how, how was his english back then um it was broken but he he could he could manage he could manage a little bit but like you know we all spoke jujitsu so we, yeah. we were able to get by um and no but he was he helped me out with my guillotine and uh the side choke he was and just just you know just the pressure he he was so good you would never believe that he was just like a you know, a featherweight or a bantamweight, whatever he was at the time, because he felt just as heavy as Echo or, uh, you know, Chris he, Ruiz. He, he didn't shy away from street fights either. Oh, no. <laughs> That's funny you say that, because I remember us going out to lunch one time, me and my little brother and uh, Hani, and then we went out because there were so many, like, uh, you know, Asian little, like, uh, Po spots or like whatever you, that was that was good and then we went and then uh he, and we had to pull him away he was about to get in a fight with like the the server you know for whatever reason i don't know he just didn't understand him or whatnot but yeah honey is he's hilarious man that guy i learned a lot from him too i was lucky enough to learn from dean and honey and you know all my great training partners back in the day he, uh, in 2007, in Trent, New Jersey, Drew Fickett was at the ADCC, blind drunk the entire time. Oh, a I heard about that. Absolutely obnoxious. Hani threw him, like the Brazilians just had enough. They beat the shit out of him, like legit beat the shit out of him. And Hani hit him with a length ankle lock. And on our interview, Drew's like, Dude, I couldn't walk on this thing for about two months, and I just kind of limped away, but you know, faked it, going, "Yeah, that wasn't shit." And he's like, "Man, that fucking thing hurt. It hurt." <laughs> yeah, Honey's not afraid of a street fight, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Joe Nichols triangle, and then you you go into Monterey, Mexico, with Cage of Fire. Um, you fight a four no guy, Paris La Fuera Ruiz. Monterey, Mexico. Who was the promoter for that? Was that Master Vic? I honestly can't even remember. I I, I want to say it was um. To, I thought it was Tony Perez. Maybe. Okay. Do you do you, you know? Who no, that Master. Is? No, I know Master Vic came in shortly after that and kind of took over the Monterey area. He does the Spanish commentary for the oh, UFC. Okay. Yeah. 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 I well, guess. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can't, I can't even remember, honestly. That was when too many beers ago. 
You win <laughs> one by rear naked choke. Lucas Factor, he's three and three. You win by KO. And I so Lucas like, Factor, that mm. guy, he was a Poway wrestler, and um, I believe like a state qualifier also. So like I remember going into that fight, like a lot of people were like warning me, being like, "Oh yeah, this guy's super tough. This guy's like made it to state. Like I barely won CIF at Hilltop at the time, but like." I think we were like the same year and um, and they're like, oh, yeah, the fact I, I think he had brothers, too. And they called him, you know, they were the infamous factor brothers. And um, but um, yeah, I remember just. Uh, he had no stri- he had no stand up. <laughs> so I, I, I remember I, I kicked him in the leg a few times and then that took away his takedowns. And then um, and then, yeah. How did I win that fight again? How yeah. was that? KO. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Sounds about right. Jesse Taylor was in his corner. I remember Jesse was my friend too at the time, or like we knew of each other. We were like kind of the same year. So afterwards, I was like, oh, hope your boy's okay. You know, have a good yeah, work but, later. You but JT Money? Yeah. JT Money. <laughs> He's a lunatic. <laughs> He might be one of the most difficult people to track down for an interview I've ever had in my entire life. Oh, man. Like, yeah. Yeah, all right, five minutes, I'll be there. 45 minutes later, hey, dude, wait near. Yeah, I'm just finishing up. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'm like, <laughs> oh. I, I, I don't know. I know he only person to win tough twice and never fight in the finale. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Throwdown Elite Training Center opens January 2nd, 2008. Hans Mullenkamp makes his entry into the mixed martial arts space. You were one of the first people there. Yes, I helped put up those cages with uh, Hans and Brent and uh, everybody. I remember that. That was a good time. Like uh, I was actually supposed to go to one of my old friends from uh, uh high school his wedding in florida that same weekend but i had to tell him sorry bro i couldn't make it i i, I gotta be here for the for the gym you know and um and yeah so it was a good time um how many crews was there at this point as well am i correct or am i off on my timeline i think he was at um uh undisputed with with a uh, war machine and like all those, those guys he was like roommates with uh warm and toby toby imada imada stud uh-huh. yeah um they were over there but they would kind of like come and cross train um you know just like because i remember we would have like a sparring day on friday which is always typically sparring day uh, and then they would all come in because we were all fighting in the same like uh you know events like total combat and you know wh- wherever it was and then um uh i remember like yeah eric was kind of starting to take charge of that as like build up alliance and brandon also but brandon would never come to uh to uh throw down elite training center which later turned into victory mma um so yeah it's crazy the turnover of gyms would happen in california it's it's like a jigsaw puzzle (laughs) true true there's so many yeah you and hans i know him and dominic cruz had a little public spat i always just kind of figured you know they knew each other way back then Hans would go out of his way to look out for him, but, you know, hey, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think Hans is only always looking out for only Hans and always trying to make his his Instagram uh, with more followers. (laughs) It's because he was trying to – he would try to get, like, you know – big names like Daniel Cormier and, uh, and Dom to like do stupid things like, like on his Instagram for him, like, you know what I mean? So I think Dom just got fed up with it one day. I think when Haunt or when, uh, Dom finally came back from one of his knee injuries and, um, he was sponsored by 
monster. And then all of a sudden, like he found out that Hans dropped him and then was like sponsoring. I think I want to say like one of his uh, like TJ Dillashaw, like one of his rivals who he was uh, potentially going to fight. So, um, yeah, I think that that was the whole reasoning why behind that. um, Yeah, that little spat. I've had a few people on here, Eric Apple being one of them. It's hard to get people to really say nice things about him that are not being paid. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with all of them. Yeah, I don't know. He never paid me. Well, I'm a Midwest guy, so like kind of that California showmanship kind of escapes us here in the Midwest, which is why we're a flyover state. Um, And uh, Hans definitely falls into that category. Like, I'm sure he's a great guy. I can't wrap my head around him. Like, guys like the Schmo, I don't don't get any of that. You know? Like, I don't don't know. It's (laughs) on me. Maybe I'm old. Uh, Johnny Torres, 5-0. You're stepping it up. He's actually out of the 303 Training Center. Um, you're starting to fight harder guys now. Like you kind of got those two out of the way and now you're stepping on a gas again. Yeah. Yeah. Those were good times, man. I remember those. How did I win that one again? You you won by guillotine. Okay. And and then you hit Noah Tedesco with a KO. And then on June 19th, uh, you're preparing for a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu super fight at East Lake MMA. And you pulled off because you're going to the UFC. <laughs> it's fucking yeah. wild. Those were good times. I remember when uh, I remember Joe Silva. Uh, actually, uh, one of my one of my good training partners, uh, Greg McIntyre. He was already he got signed to the WEC, and he like he knew the tap out guys. Um, you know, uh, mask and skyscrape and punk ass or whatever yeah, Dan, and yeah. and yeah they came to throw down elite i think it was still throw down elite at the time and they were sponsoring greg for his wec upcoming wec fight and he was like part of the whole tv show that they made i think it was on versus and um like they came in and just like basically came in to watch and film an episode and show his like up and, and pick him up and take him to the fight. And um, I was just Greg's number one training partner at the time. And we were just training nonstop. And then they were like, Hey, we want to sponsor Shannon also. And, uh, and sure enough, uh, like within that same week of me, Oh no. When I went to uh, the WEC, they flew me in cause, cause Greg, went on the uh the winnebago or whatever it was uh that the tap out t- truck yeah 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 taking them to to i think it was it was either vegas or, or somewhere it was anyways um i remember being in the same car as and i had no idea who he was but it was joe silva was uh on my same uh ride so and um and we just got the talking and he was like oh yeah um and he had already kn- known who i was so um that was co- pretty cool um and then he was um he just said you know uh well let me get your phone number and do you have a manager or anything and at the time i didn't have any manager uh so i was just like yeah here's my phone number i still <laughs> was kind of skeptical of who he really was right. until <laughs> until at the, yeah because he's this little guy but he knew everything he knew everybody you know and um and then finally like uh at the event uh when we're walking out i could see joe silva like right there cage side you know and i'm like oh shit maybe he is somebody important you know <laughs> yeah yeah you know he deserves to be in the ufc hall of fame i know some people got some pushback against him he socialized really well made some hella good matchups. He belongs in that UFC Hall of Fame, in my opinion. Yeah, no, he he gave me my first shot, for sure. Because so as soon as I got home, um, like within a week, maybe two tops, uh, he called my phone and he's like, hey, are you going to be ready to fight in one month or so or something like that? And I'm like, I'm like, wait, who is this? He's like, this is Joe, Joe Silva, you know, uh, 
uh, with the with the UFC. Are you going to be ready to fight? We're gonna we're throwing together a card to rival um, the Affliction card. You know, so we're gonna have um, uh, Anderson Silva fight James Irving as the main event, and we want you to fight on the card. Are you gonna be ready to fight like in four weeks? And I'm like like shut the fuck up and i like hung up on him i'm like this is this guy's lying to me you know and yeah, no he, he called me he called me right punks. back <laughs> yeah seriously <laughs> he called me right back and um he's like no i'm dead serious this is joe silva i'm i'm gonna fax you over a a, a contract you know um do you uh, would, you know sh- give me a fax number or whatever and i'm like all right whatever i gave him you know um Five, five, five. Yeah, yeah, one, two, one, two. Right. So, right. so sure enough, it was a contract. You know, three to show, three to win. You know, <laughs> more. You know what? I bet you took a hit on ticket sales because I guarantee you killed it. <laughs> you freaking killed it on ticket sales. You had, to. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I did okay. I mean, I was, I was just super happy to be like in the you know, UFC at that point in time, you know? So, and then I think they gave me another undefeated guy. He was one of Marcus Davis. Uh, yeah. The Irish hand grenade, Dan Hart. Yeah. Trained by Marcus yeah. Davis. Ultimate yeah. Fight night 14, July 19th, 2008. Sounds about right. Yeah. That was a good one. I won that one by rear naked choke. I think it was. And then just kind of flip flopped, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly, I couldn't even believe it. Like my first UFC win after I won by submission in the first round too. And, um, it was, it was a good time. It was a really good time. <laughs> you, you, you know how, how I see it. You're part of the 2%, the top 2% in the country just to make it to the UFC. And very rarely does that top 2% get to experience their hand raised inside that cage. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. 0-2, 0-3 guys that legit tough guys that just couldn't get that win inside there. Yeah, Dale Hart was a tough guy too. I think he For won sure. his next fight after that. I, I remember he broke um, Corey Hill's uh, leg. Corey Hill tried to kick him and he checked his leg. And I remember I was there and I heard it crack. It was like the most disgusting this thing I've ever heard like in a fight. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah, the thing with Corey Hill, he lied his way to get on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, but, like, the elite coaches that have ever dealt with him, like Jeremy Horn being one of them, they all say, most talented fighter I have ever seen come walking through the door, bar none, period, Corey Hill. Wow. Like, the people that have been on a mat with him all say the same thing. And it was just like, well, you know, he fought in the UFC his first fight ever. Like it, while the UFC was pretty established at this point in terms of tough guys, we're not talking pre two thousand four. Like it's right, it's stiff competition there. They yeah. did you no favors on your on your fight at UFC ninety with Spencer Fisher. Yeah, I remember I was terrified of Spencer Fisher because I remember growing up watching Spencer Fisher fighting like beating tiago alves you know at 170 and then they they gave me him for um for my second fight and at 155 and it was in chicago it was yeah, a good it was, I a was good, there for it that was, it was a really cool um event you know even, even though i lost i had a great time it was a another great learning experience you know um, and it helped me, you know, deal with some nerves a lot better uh, in the next couple fights, just because, like, I was terrified of Spencer Fisher. He was the first and only fighter that was literally talking to me in the middle of the fight. Uh, you know, after I would get a takedown on him, he would just be like, come on, Shannon, you don't want to win like this, you know, and like just kind of getting in my head and uh so toodles to him, you know, good, good on him. But, um, yeah, he was a, a, a little more experienced, you know, and, um, but I, I, I took from that. And then I think I went into the next fight. They luckily enough, I was one of the lucky ones to get, uh, put on that UFC 100 card, which, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the, uh, 
Poster, yeah, Mike. The Mac poster Rice. right there, yeah. Matt and, Grice um, was your opponent. Matt Grice, another super tough wrestler, you know. And Oklahoma, uh, yeah, he was Oklahoma. a gamer. Yeah, gamer, he was ten to two. Sure. But here, Spencer Fisher was twenty-one and four, and you make the announcement that you will never be submitted again. Like I thought it was pretty cool. It was some good showmanship, you know. Like, hey, dude, I lost. You know, boom. And Matt Grice, uh, at the time, police officer. I think still is a police officer. Yeah, near fatal, near fatal car yeah. crash. You know, Poor he's guy. one of those. He's one of those footnotes in MMA. I, I'd hate to see his story get lost. Yeah, no, he he's a good dude too. Like <laughs> like a good person, also. You know, be a police officer and juggling the W E or uh, the U- UFC. UFC at the same time. You know, um, yeah, he's a good guy. Terry and then Adam. also mm-hmm. another one who he he. Both both of us dropped down later on, like after I think we got or he, they might have even brought him back because that's what I remember. Joe Silva told me like after when I finally did get released from the UFC, he said, just go win three in a row outside of the UFC and we'll bring you right back. And we're, we're, we're going to bring we're going to bring back a, a different weight class also. And I think you'll be better at that weight class. And sure enough, they did that with with Matt Grice, I think, before his uh, his accident. Uh, accident. Yeah. Clay Guida, one of the most incredible and memorable pictures ever with Clay's hair behind him, like uh, connecting on a punch. Uh, Sean Shirk pulled out of that fight. You you stepped in. I think he trained. A yeah, big bear. that was trained that was a big a ba- bear. That, yeah, but that was a I I came in late to that training camp uh, and was late on that uh notice and again, no excuses. I lost fair and square. I've seen Clay Guida since then. We're cool. Good good guy. Really good yeah. guy. He's a great fisherman, him and his family. Um but um but I think I got talked uh, I don't think I I know I got talked into that fight through my manager at the time who uh, um you know, was it? I'm gonna. It, it was Matt Stansel. Uh, he was oh. the N- N- NCFC, uh, right? I, I think yeah. it was called. And he they used to manage all of us me, Brandon, Dom, um, anybody, all of us. But, um, I remember, yeah, it was it was Sean Shirk or somebody whoever had pulled out, and then uh, they're like, yeah, you're uh, you got it you got it Shannon. And I'm, I was like coming off of a vacation or something like that. And, oh. But a- anyways, you know, I lost. You took the fight. You signed a contract. It yeah. is what it is. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is. It was good times. Clay's a good guy. And throw um, down a, yeah, throw down an elite becomes uh victory MMA 2010 in July. Yep. All right. So shine fights. This is, uh, an organization that dumped a ton of money into MMA and dude, they did some Drew really Fickett won that one, right? Dude, Drew dude won that. incredible. It, they did some super, super cool stuff there. And it was almost like the UFC had a PR campaign that would go out of their way to really uh, kind of like bash their organization and make life miserable for them. Wow. Yeah. What was I your remember. experience like in Shine Fights? I think they switched the venue like the week of your fight. Yeah, not, yeah. Uh-huh. It it was it was a little. Um, I mean, for the most part, it was pretty organized, but there was a lot of little like uh, adjustments that they had to make um, in during the week of the fight when they flew us out there. And from my understanding, what it was was it was like a either a four or an eight man tournament something like that to fight potentially to get 50k i think it was and um i remember watching drew fickett uh like them dragging him in because he was like he was dead like he was dead like trying just to make the 155 pound weight class and um and I think I got matched up against uh, Dennis Bermudez. Dennis Bermudez, super tough guy. Yeah, they signed Legit. him right. They signed him to the UFC right after he beat me. Right after he uh, got, got out of that event, and then at, at featherweight too. So, um, so yeah, no, that was another good experience. You know, um, 
Uh, that was, what was the circus like? Like, for instance, like it was in Virginia, and then it gets moved to an Indian reservation in Oklahoma. Right, 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 right. I Everyone remember that. expected it to be canceled. Yeah, it, it was Oklahoma, I guess. Yeah, it yeah. was an Indian reservation. We were out in the middle of nowhere, and then, um, yeah, it was just, it was just kind of like, you know, very, very. Uh, it felt organized, but it was disorganized. Everybody was like, oh, shit, you know, scrambling around, just trying to figure out, like, where to go to eat, to, to grab some food, where to go to, you know, um, whatever it may be. But, um, but yeah, it, it was it was a good time. I wouldn't take anything back from uh, my whole entire career. You know, I had a great no. time and. Yeah, it was good times. And, and you know how you got the fight, too. I mean, Jason Chambers, being the chief operating officer, contacted you. But Marcus Aurelio pulls out two days before the event, you know, because he's injured, and then ends up fighting Ayaki two weeks later. <laughs> oh, wow. So I, I replaced uh, Marcus Aurelio. Aurelio? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember that was another short-notice fight. Um, uh, two days. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, you know, I, I think it was my my girlfriend at the time, but now wife's birthday. Um, what was the date of it? It was. It's uh, September tenth, two thousand. Yeah, yeah, because she's late October, so it was a good. It was a good, uh, maybe, yeah, couple days notice. I remember they were scrambling around, and I was just like, "Screw it, I'll fight," you know. Um, Court Probably McGee. should, you know. Yeah, Court McGee, Peter Sabota, Joe Brammer, Tomas Drawl. You had a good little crew that you were working oh, out yeah, with. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were all good guys. All good guys. Yeah, Jeremy and uh, J- yeah. Jan, 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 uh, what's his name? John, uh, the the light heavyweight who's uh, from Poland. What's his name? John in Blackovich. The, Blackovich. John Blackovich. He was there too. Yeah. He, he was, was there in too. Your, really? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. No shit. Yeah, so, we had a good little mm-hmm. team. Yeah. I mean, even Jeremy Stevens was there. Yeah. Wow. Roscoe Jackson, you win with a KO. Cruz Gomez is 14 and 8. He's a WEC vet. On a winning streak, that was one you needed, dude. Talk about pressure going <laughs> into that fight. Yeah, the California there... Fight Syndicate. Yeah, where where was that venue at? California, it was in Fight San Diego. Syndicate. It was in was San it? Diego. Okay, maybe they were just trying to rival uh, Eric's event, Eric's Total Combat. Desert Rage Full Contact, you beat Ernie Davila, and then you end your career in Dublin. Cage Contenders, 14th, July 21st, 2012. Now, that was a hard one right there because I ended the first round in, he was in my rear naked choke, and the bell went off. And then he's like tapping, and the referee breaks us up. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I pretty much, I won that round. I pretty much dominated position and whatnot. Um, the second round, it came out like, uh, I can't remember exactly how it went down, but I remember it was kind of back and forth. Third round came out. And all I remember is hearing this fucking idiot in the crowd, just keep screaming and talking, talking shit to me, you know, and later come to find out that that was Conor McGregor who was in his corner. Yeah. Who was just like screaming and yelling. And that was, uh, yeah. Um, Do you think uh, you won that fight? I heard, like, I was told that you got robbed. Yeah. I felt like I won that fight at least by, you know, uh, two rounds, you know, at least two and, rounds. Exactly. And maybe, maybe a 10, eight first round. If you're, if he's tapping yes. after the yes. bell. Yes. Owen Roddy, that's his name, right? Owen yeah. Roddy, that 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 was his name. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm gonna go on record saying I won that fight, and <laughs> for sure, Owen but, Roddy uh, was ten it three. Is, it is what it is, you know. I was in on his home turf, you know. He had like the whole crowd with him. It was 
it was it was uh it was another another learning experience but uh i got a free trip out to ireland me and dean we hung out there for a couple weeks afterwards and dean doing some some seminars and uh just kind of you know just enjoying the irish pubs after after the fight and it was a good beautiful time. country beautiful yeah, country beautiful country beautiful country for sure so owen roddy was 10 and 3 whenever you lose a split decision and and you know you're the away team generally means you pretty much won that fight yeah yeah that was a rough one what'd you think of the promoter john ferguson um you know that was my first time meeting him i went out uh a couple months prior to that with dean when dean fought um one of their hometown heroes uh some irish guy i forget his name really nice guy though i can't remember his name but um uh john ferguson yeah he was a uh, he was a, a character for sure he 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 was like the irish mafia he tried to portray himself as like you know out there did, did, did he stiff you <laughs> he did how much did he, he get you for man uh I can't even remember exactly, but I remember I didn't get paid what I was supposed to get paid. I remember that. And it took, how long did it take you to even get anything out of him? It was like the check was in the mail and it was like, just, you know, so you, wait, it was wait, like so you, you, wait, you left the venue with no money from him for that fight. Yeah. I can't remember any money uh, until, until later on I got a, Actually, I think it was Dean who got me the check because he was hounding him uh, a little bit more because uh, and then and then. Yeah. So I, I, I honestly can't remember the, the exact numbers, but I remember I did not get paid what I was supposed to get paid for sure for that fight. I personally really enjoy the gangster promoters that can't pay their <laughs> bills. They can't pay their bills. <laughs> oh, man, I agree. I agree. Wow. Dude, you had a hell of a career, man. Yeah, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth after that, after that one, you know, because I remember it was like, yeah, you know, I'll just win a couple more in a row, get back to the, you know, UFC, maybe even go to WEC if they hadn't absorbed it by the, at that time, um, you know, at a lighter weight class, more at featherweight where I, I, I feel like I'm my, my body frame is a better size for, you know, cause like, I remember also like Max Holloway, Jeremy Stevens, uh, flying Max in before anybody even knew who Max was at the time, helping them get ready for, um, Anthony Pettis, oh, you know, brilliant yeah. move. because, uh, he, he was like jumping off the cage and, you know, kicking people in the face and what, what not back in Hawaii at the time. And, I had no idea who he was, but he hung out with us for like at least a good solid month. And um, we, we, we were good. We, we became good friends, you, you know, he was a great training partner. Um, just, you know, good guy overall and very young. And, um, and I knew for sure he was going to make it to the UFC for sure. Like uh, Max is a legend. So yeah, that was good times. Good, good, good times and good venues. Good, good, uh, good gyms that we all trained at, and we all just kind of like kept following each other all over the place. Because even when I would tr fight uh, out of you know uh, victory or throw down elite, I would still um, you know cross train down at Alliance when they opened that up uh, with Eric and Dom and. Um, Ed, Ed Ratcliffe, uh, who else? There were so many good guys, man. There was just so many good guys in San Diego. Edwin Aguilar. Ed, Edwin yeah, Aguilar. Sanchez, yeah. Jason yeah. Lambert did a little stint there. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Mauricio Camoes. Yeah, Camoes yeah. was there. Yeah, Morongo. Jorge, Jorge Ortiz. Yeah, you guys had you guys had a good little crew, man. And you, you know the thing is, it's like you guys all kept each other honest. Yeah, for sure. I agree. So you got a school now. We probably should have started with this, but why don't we talk about what you got going right now? 
Well, right now I got a, a small little dojo. Uh, it's just basically jujitsu. I run some jujitsu classes out of it. Um, you know, it's just kind of like one of my side businesses that I have, but I also still go over to uh, Victory MMA uh, to go help teach some jujitsu over there. Uh, they're always uh, needing, you know, an, an instructor to help out for gi or no gi. Um, I also help out with uh, some of the MMA fight team there at Victory. The They have amateur and a pro fight team, uh, which <clears throat> most of the time they kind of combined each other but uh combined with each other but uh right now victory is uh still uh you know fixing all of its uh the its fire, fire. <laughs> the, yeah, fire the fire that, that hey, happened let's, let's talk about your dojo the name location so people at home uh you could swing over it's called uh, Rise Above Jiu-Jitsu, and it's off of Morena Boulevard. Um, I'm right behind Costco, and um, it's uh, it, Harley Davidson and Costco is right there. I'm right behind that. And, uh, yeah, we, we got a good little crew in there. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so that's that. We pretty much teach... 6.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. are the two main classes uh, every day. Or at least you. at least Monday through Friday. Uh, Good for you. And then Good Saturdays we do a little open mat and yeah. But I, I, I do like to go over there down to, uh, to Victory every once in a while just to get some, you know, different bodies, different training in, you know, just see what everybody else is doing nowadays just to get a little cross training in. And then, um, and then also I've, I've made it since victory has been, uh, shut down this last month. Uh, I've been going down a little, little bit, uh, to Azteca down there in, uh, uh, Bonita and, uh, go train with, you know, Jeremy and Dom and, uh, um, Phil Davis and, um, yeah, get some, get some rounds in with the big guys. You know, yeah, so, good crew. Good guy, good crew. Yeah. San Diego's yeah, not crew. a hard place to find a good gym at. That's for sure. Did you ever foresee Jocko being as socially popular as he has become? No, I never would have imagined that. But but then again, like when Echo and him started that podcast, I knew like after listening to a couple of their podcasts of them just like their, their banter back and forth. I knew that like, you know, he was, you know, he was definitely speaking some knowledge, you know, and who wouldn't want to learn from a master Navy SEAL chief, you know, um, of his experiences. And he's a, he's a great guy, you know, as, as, as it is. And he's always helped me with everything, anything I've ever asked Jocko to help me out with. He's been there for me. So, um, you know, I, I, I owe a lot to him too. You know, uh, he's cornered me in a couple of fights, a couple of UFC fights um, when, you know, Dean couldn't make it or Dean was out of town with seminars or, uh, you know, Brent or Eric or just one of them couldn't be there. And he, he, at, not not so much for, you know, the technique and knowledge, but just kind of like, keeping that mindset and just staying focused and you know he's great for that you know he's he's great guy for that and coincidentally i used to teach when um i used to teach his kids uh at the in the kids program at victory when we first started uh, when i guess when it was back at as throwdown elite and uh jocko would just come on in and help out a little bit and um yeah he would just let me go ahead and take charge so i would be primarily the the primary uh kids jujitsu instructor at the time and then now we're looking at rana and thor and now they're all teaching you know at the adult classes now at victory so how it comes for full circle that's wild crazy. yeah that's wild man yeah and it's you're you're passing the baton from one generation to another, you being obviously 
you know, one of the top first tier, you know, to come across that finish line, you know, with mixed martial arts. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, especially California. California's got such a rich history, you know, between they wrestling, do. even high school football there is is monstrous, rivals Texas. You guys got a lot of good stuff happening there, man. Really cool. Really cool to see like cognizant, no slur, no you didn't have a lot of, con- <laughs> you didn't have a lot of concussions, did you? Um J- mostly like the one maybe two concussions that i ever really felt didn't even come in a fight it came in sparring practice. in practice yeah that's like even with headgear on you know like it was just yeah we we would try and we would try and kill each other like at like during sparring like it w- there was no technical sparring back then it was like okay shark tank you know you're going in you, you you got dom first round you got you know edwin aguilar second round you got freaking you know it was rolando oh perez God. third greg mack fourth round and we would do like you know six seven rounds five minute rounds you know at the time so it, it, cool. it was rough it was rough. good it's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, it's metal sharpens, you know, iron sharpens iron. I mean, it is what it is. You know, it's what got you sure. in the UFC. So Shannon, I, I cannot thank you enough. I know we're trying to piece this together for a few weeks. And I mean, you were more than accommodating in regards to making this happen. Uh, I'm going to try oh, to get pleasure. this out on Monday as well. Thank you so much, man. I sincerely appreciate it. So ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Gugarty, uh, Timmy Ford. I tell you what, he gets the MVP. He gets the MVP for the month of March. This guy's really come through for us. So, Timmy Ford, thank you. I, I know you had a bailout because you had, got a, had a gig. All right, this is what we need. We need iTunes reviews. I just got, like, my uh, chartable fact sheet back, which kind of tells you where you're at in regards to your podcast. We're number 89 in Pakistan. Dude, swear to God, somebody over there probably downloaded one episode and we're, we, we came in at like number 89 in Pakistan. I don't know how they get this shit, but if you guys can leave a review on iTunes, it helps us. We need about, about 250 to 300. We're you know, just under 70 right now. And um, once we get 250, 300, it becomes suggested on other people's mixed martial arts programs. And um, it really helps us out. So iTunes reviews, Google comments. Um, we've got a couple of projects in the works right now in regards to creating an independent mixed martial arts, like the Indie Grind library. I've got a few hundred DVDs throughout the country from the independent grind that are you know not on Fight Pass or anywhere else. So I, I think I'm going to be kind of putting together a little bit of library um, for everybody to kind of dive into, not just that of myself. So, ladies and gentlemen, please support us. We support you. Like, share, subscribe. Thank you so much. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.